And just equip them, even now, as they prepare to just share from their hearts what it means, Lord Jesus, that you died for them. And God, may we be encouraged by one another. This is your church. This is a family. Just sharing all that you've done and reflecting on your word tonight. So may we just be, uh, we receive these words with hope and with promise in our hearts that you are the Savior who has come and the Savior who is coming again. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And just a, a quick note on this, um, due to some circumstances, Mike and Tiffany Martinez couldn't be here tonight, so uh, Jared I is going to give that word in their place, so thanks Jared for stepping in uh, at the last, uh, last hour here for that. So I'll invite Tish to come on forward, and uh, Tish will begin, and uh, thank you so much for, for leading off tonight, and you can just speak from right behind the lectern there, so thank you Tish. Luke twenty three thirty four, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. As I returned to my faith in Jesus within the last year and a half, this verse has popped into my head many times in regards to myself and to others. My prayer has been, Father, forgive me, for I did not know what I was doing. This is not to absolve myself of my thoughts, actions, or decisions. It's just that I didn't understand. I didn't understand spiritual things, including the importance of my thoughts and maybe even movements. Over the years, I never stopped believing in God, but I desperately wanted to believe that we were all touching the same God, just different parts of the same elephant. With this mindset, I found myself randomly exploring the wisdom and practices of other religions. Although initially drawn in by the health benefits, I found great wisdom, incredible beauty, and moments of serene peace in practicing yoga. I was hooked and I later became involved in the more advanced spiritual practices of chanting and breath and energy work. However, as the side effects became more alarming over time, I began to wonder if I had gone too far. I felt strange sensations and vibrations, experienced bizarre ailments, and had weird encounters with people and nature. Of course, gradually a serpent motif began to emerge in the background of all these experiences. Finally, one night I came to the realization that I was being attacked spiritually. I felt helpless until I remembered the power of Jesus' name, and I began to cast out all unclean, unclean spirits from myself and my surroundings. I am here today because Jesus has died for my sins and given me a faith that has true power because he has conquered death. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. John 3:14-15. There is so much that I continue to not understand, However, I am very grateful to God for two things, the extremely enduring and patient love of my husband and the love of this church. I am here at this church, this community of strong and caring believers, because to not be here would be to be lost. So my prayer continues to be, Father, forgive me, I did not know what I was doing. I did not know I was opening myself up, what I was opening myself up to. I did not know I was changing allegiances. Father, forgive me. I have been hesitant to speak and to share my testimony because I continue to struggle to know what I'm doing, especially in relation to physical practices and being healthy. The difference is that I have found my anchors again, God's word and people. I'd like to cl close with Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and the breastplate of righteousness in, your pl in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Luke twenty three forty three. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, 
Today you will be with me in paradise. I just want to say how thankful I am for what he did for me. I grew up in a home, um, seven brothers and sisters, and my parents didn't know how to show love. I mean, they, they knew how to take care of us. They clothed us, they fed us, they took us to church. Um, you know, the motions, going through the motions. So anyways, I ended up leaving home when I was 14 years old and never went back. And I found the love of Christ out there and he just filled my heart and my life and gave me everything I needed and took everything that was broken and never, not everything is good, but he's still working on me and I just praise him for his love. If you seek him, you'll find him because he's looking for you. <laughs> Thank you. My verse is John 19, 26 through 27. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple who he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus is suffering unimaginable pain, unimaginable pain on the cross, and yet he's still thinking of others. He knew his mother was and would continue to suffer unthinkable pain during and after her son's crucifixion. He was filling a need, a human need for someone else, all while suffering the worst death in order to forgive human sins. During our own trouble, excuse me, uh, during our own trouble, we think about ourselves. We may say, how can I possibly tend to the needs of others? We feel alone in our problems, but in giving comes joy. If we reach out to others, we take the focus off of ourselves. Um, I, I went to a Lutheran school up until second grade, and then from there moved here and didn't go to church anymore. Um, my dad said that my sister and I should choose what, what religion we wanted to be, because my mom is Catholic, and that's the Catholic side of the family. I grew up with that family, and the basis is that Jesus died for us and for our sins, and he loves us, and... Then when Nicholas was born, my sister's son, life changed. Um, each of us is going through something, and in Christ, we are one family who must take care of each other. Family looks different and can mean different things for everyone. I know my family's not traditional, and that I have a closer relationship with my nephew than most aunts. That started because of the example that my family set, and that was with Christ, with my grandparents. My grandparents and uncle have played a huge part in who I am and have become. They filled in the role of second parent when my parents separated. To this day, I can count on them for anything. This carried on to my role in my nephew's life. He may not be my child, but in my heart, he is. The point is, is that we step in and we care for each other. In John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, Jesus set the example for us. Uh, Matthew 27, 46. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, <laughs> that's got to be, I think, the most poignant moment probably in, in history. Uh, when God the Son, uh, for the first time in all eternity, uh, it felt the absence of a perfect, holy uh, fellowship with his father. Um, it's just very hard to for us even to, I think, understand just 
how drastic of a change that moment was for Christ because he had always experienced the joy of God towards him. And now he's uh, facing the judgment of God, but not for his own sins, for our sins. Um, and that that's incredible, right? And, and, and uh, just being a new dad sort of, for me, just, I can only just get a glimpse of those sort of feelings that the father must have had and the son must have had when this exchange was happening. Um, but that's the good news, too, because uh, Christ's willingness and the father's willingness to have his son uh, experience his wrath that we deserved um, allows us uh, to be drawn close, to be reconciled and to have fellowship with him through Christ. Um, and that's why really it goes from a terrible Friday to a very good Friday for us uh, in Christ. And um, this passage has always been striking to me um, because uh, <laughs> um, I, we don't read anywhere where Christ cried out in physical pain, uh, but here he's crying out, and this is like the utmost of agony, and it's all it's because he's experiencing this separation from the Father, and um, well, I, my little guy, he. Uh, he, for a long time, he slept in bed with Robin and I at night, and he's a great sleeper. Uh, but every morning, no matter how heavy he was asleep and no matter how um, stealthily Robin would get up out of bed in the morning, somehow Josiah would just know that she was gone. And all of a sudden, he just wakes up in panic, and he's saying, Mommy, 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 and he's not consolable, and I try all the daddy tricks Oh, it's okay. I hold them and all these things. And I try to distract them. And mommy's just going and she'll be right back. Don't worry. Don't worry. Panic. And this happens like almost every morning. Mommy, mommy, mommy. And just that feeling of abandonment, I guess, that he, that he has. Uh, tears and everything. And this is just for a couple minutes of separation between him and mom. Uh, but then when she returns, uh, all of a sudden, the tears are gone and he's happy and smiling and he's close to her again and just holding on. Uh, and that, and I, and God just, I think taught me or te is teaching me something there because, uh, even though I didn't realize it, my years of being apart from him on my own, uh, maybe I didn't feel that separation, uh, but I was because of my sin far from God. Um, but then in Christ, uh, to have the access to him, to be able to be close to God again, through the forgiveness of sins because of what Christ endured on the cross. Man, I, I'm learning from my son here, uh, just and from God, to just enjoy that simple love of fellowship with my father through Christ. And uh, that that's kind of what this passage is, put on my heart um, to share tonight, but, uh, and I, my prayer um, for me and for everyone is just, Lord, let me experience just the joy of being close to you every day because of what Christ did, and, uh, and I just praise God for, for that moment of separation between him and his son, so thank you. I thirst, John nineteen twenty eight. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Jesus has been hanging on the cross for six hours now. His thirst comes from blood loss, from his severe flogging. 
the nails piercing his hands and feet, the crown of thorns pressed into his head. It has become hard for Jesus even to get a breath. Hanging from his outstretched arms, he must pull himself up each time he wants to breathe. Scraping his wounded back on the cross, His body aches, his mouth is parched, he is exhausted. Gasping for air with each breath, his mouth is dry. His blood loss and shock all cause thirst. He asks for something to drink, to wet his lips for his final effort, his final words. He is obedient to the Father, even unto death. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. What scripture was to be fulfilled? Possibly Psalm 69, 21, written by David. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Imagine the stinging on his lips and the mouse, mouth from the vinegar wine. His lips are cracked and bleeding. His mouth is parched. But he continues for you and for me. I think there's another thirst Jesus experiences while hanging there. A spiritual thirst. To be with God the Father. The physical pain and suffering of being crucified on the cross for my transgressions, my sins, and paying for the sins of the world so we could all be restored to a relationship with the Father is only part of it. The spiritual isolation from the Father while hanging there was agonizing. Can you imagine how alone Jesus must have felt? How much pain he was in, torment that he was going through in order to pay for our sins. I thirst. Oh, do Jesus, what you did for me on that cross and what the Father allowed you to go through for me, the depths of that love never ending, the grace that is freely given. I thirst to know you better, Lord, deeper, with fullness of life and appreciation, seeking you in all aspects of my life, for you are my God. And because of you, dear Jesus, I am a child of God. You have suffered unimaginable pain for me, even unto death. So no matter my life circumstance, you know me, you love me, and you are there for me in pain, in joy, in sorrow, in gladness, and in everlasting life. There was a young woman who was thirsting for God But she wanted one question of Jesus. Where was God when I was being molested as a child? The answer came. Jesus was kneeling beside you and weeping. She accepted Christ that day and has a normal life because of Jesus being her savior. Being a Christian does not mean that we will not have struggles. It does mean that Jesus is with us. And that pain that he suffered on that cross for sins he never committed, he knows every person's pain that could ever be imagined. He sees the children that are homeless. He sees those living on our streets. 
He sees those that have lost a child or a father or a mother or a brother. He sees those that have gone to war and seen unspeakable horrors. And you know what? He loves them. And he loves you and me. John 4.13 Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Dear Jesus, my thirst is quenched by you, and I am grateful. Thank you for loving me and calling me according to your purpose. Thank you for the Bible, the Word of God, and that I can more fully know you through Bible study and prayer. Thank you for going to the cross and being thirsty on my behalf. John 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Of the last sayings of Christ on the cross, none is more important than it is finished. Found only in the Gospel of John, the Greek word, which I can't pronounce, which is translated as it is finished, means paid in full. When Jesus uttered those words, he was declaring the debt owed to his father was wiped away completely and forever. Not that Jesus wiped away any debt that he owed to the father. Rather, Jesus eliminated the debt of my sin, my sin and your sin, the sin of the world. He ransomed us eliminating the power of sin and darkness forever. It is finished. There were many things finished at the cross that day. The sufferings Jesus endured while on the earth, and especially in his final hours, were at last over. God's will for Jesus was accomplished in his perfect obedience to the Father. More importantly, the power of sin and Satan was finished. His finished work on the cross was the beginning of new life for all of us who were once dead in our transgressions and sins, but who are now made alive with Christ. He ensured that my trespasses and sins <clears throat> I'm sorry. He ensured that my sin died with him on that cross so that I could be resurrected with him. It is finished. Through faith in Jesus, I have the promise of life eternal with God. Although finished signals an end, that end signals a beginning, a new beginning where death and darkness have no power, where the grip of pride and the strangling weight of sin are lifted, where my sin-scarred body is forever wrapped in the light of Christ covering me for all eternity. The only price I paid for this salvation is my faith. Yet still knowing all this, I find myself, <clears throat> excuse me, I find myself caught in the ways of this world, often swept up in human emotion, making decisions following my sinful human nature that I later ask forgiveness for, as we all do. Yet I come forward boldly to his cross and seek his forgiveness, his cleansing, his grace, often ashamed of a short temper or a wrong decision, but knowing full well the breadth and depth of his mercy and loving kindness. I do not take his grace or my salvation lightly. It is finished. 
At the price of great suffering and sacrifice, Jesus gave me life. It is finished. He speaks directly to me in those words. Three words. As children, we are taught that the three most important words are, I love you. In giving all to not only take away the punishment for my sins, but to ensure I can live forever with the Father in heaven, Jesus fulfills the greatest commandment, to love one another. It is finished is his I love you to me and to each of you. In times of fear, despair, or anxiety, I practice what a very dear friend taught me. I slowly breathe in, saying, can't say it while you're breathing in, but saying to myself, Jesus. I breathe in Jesus and slowly breathe out his mercy and his peace and even his love. In those moments, I experience his love and I know it is finished and everything will unfold according to his plan. He puts his hand on mine and calms my heart for nothing can take away what he has given me and what he sums up in those three simple yet very powerful words, it is finished. The sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Luke 23, 45 through 46. So these were Jesus' last words on the cross. And as you heard tonight, each and every one of his words have had a significance and a meaning to us. They show us, though, I think, that Jesus was certainly in control of the entire event. Even while he was hanging on the cross, these words walk us through a progression similar to, you know, times that we have in our lives where God himself interacts with us. Forgiveness, salvation, love and compassion for each other, human need, separation from God that sin is, and the giving of your life over to God. Jesus' words begin in addressing God as Father, right? Then while under stress of the cross, we see a little different use of words. He uses my God, my God. And then ending, Jesus comes back to using Father. This shows us a completion of the act of Jesus being willing and obedient to what he has given us to do. So these very last words, what do they say to us? And what was Jesus wanting us to understand? The environment kind of had to be electric. You know, the sun stopped shining for three hours, right? Okay, that in its own right is a phenomena. I mean, you got to think about that, right? Some say it might have been an eclipse, right? But for three hours, you know, we, I, I, no matter what the explanation is, I think it was just dark and somber, right? When we see occurrences in nature, like thunder and earthquakes and eclipses, you know, they're not minor little things. They kind of come with a certain amount of power, punch, and awe. And I remember when we had our most recent eclipse here, we had only a 70% that day, and yet it still gave the day an eerie feeling, right? So the setting in Golgotha was darkness. And it seemed as though the universe was kind of reeling and reacting to what was going down, right? Then over at the temple, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, the innermost sanctuary of the temple, the place where the presence of God was thought to be dwelling, was torn in two. And that was in, and the feeling that was in the air, you know, it kind of had to be kind of nothing short of scary, I think, at that time. And yet, in all of this was a message of hope. The curtain of separation was torn, and thus opening up God's presence to us all. In the temple, you know, only a certain group of the priests were allowed to go into the inner part, you know, where the presence of God dwelt. 
all others had to stay out, right? And so the message of the curtain tearing is that Jesus is now our connection to God, and he is our access and ability to be in the presence of God. He changed everything. Then comes his final words. And most of what Jesus said while he was on the cross literally is quoting scripture, which is kind of always interesting to me when you have the word quoting the word. <laughs> but here Jesus is quoting scripture, and he says, he's kind of quoting Psalms 35, 1, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, as I stated earlier, I said Jesus was, even while on the cross, was showing how much control he was. When people were crucified, normally it took about two to three days for them to die. And it was slow, and it was agonizing, and they just basically suffocated, right? But on this particular day, they had a special Sabbath at dusk, and it was the high Sabbath of the Passover. So they didn't want to have these guys up on crosses during that time. They wanted them down, right? And so the command came out to break their legs so that they would all die quicker. They would just kind of like, they wouldn't have the ability to pull themselves up and to breathe, so they would suffocate. But then also, if you look a little earlier, when Jesus was on his journey to Jerusalem, he was telling people while he was teaching. If you look at John 10, verse 8, Jesus says, No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. So in the last words of Jesus here, he gives his life, gives it as a sacrifice. That is something that we as humans can't do, right? I would challenge anyone to try and do that. Just give up your spirit. Just go ahead and die, right? It's like, I can will it, you know? Ending your life, you know, by not killing yourself is impossible, right? My grandmother, when she was old and she was sick, you know, and she was ready to go to heaven, well, one of her quotes was, you know, it's not so easy to die, right? And so we're all subject to die, but not through our own will. But Jesus gave up his life by his own will and obedience. So when the centurions came to break the legs of Jesus, they had, he was already dead, as we read in John 19, 31 through 33, and it reads, now it was the day of, the res of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs. So Jesus wasn't killed. He gave his life for us. And even in the word that he used, commit, which means to pledge and to bind, it was the ultimate sacrifice, pledging his life in payment, giving his life to be put in place of ours. This is something that our God has done, and that if you really start to think about it, you begin to understand the enormity of it. Sin is basically separation from God. What we made, we made it, uh, excuse me, we had it made. It was a perfect communion with God himself, right? And if you look at the word communion, it's a very interesting word. It is defined as the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on the mental or spiritual level. Yep, and we sinned. We had that, and we sinned. Sharing God's thoughts, God's feelings. And there was no way out except for that God himself would give his son Jesus and take on that sin, that separation for us, and pay that price in full and final with his death. The visceral emotion that of being separated from God to take on our sin was evident in Jesus as he prayed in the garden the night before and was evident in his words on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But then Jesus begins his last words with Father. So he's back. He's no longer separated from God, and he's willing and cheerfully giving his life up for us. What an amazing, powerful, and awesome God we have. For you, for me, for everyone, for whosoever believes he gave his life. Wow, what a love story. 
So now, it brings me to my testimony because we've been asked to give a testimony in this as well. I'm never good at that. <laughs> so I'm Scandinavian. So here it goes. How would I describe my life? I would describe it as an ordinary, extraordinary life. I was born into a wonderful Christian family, a pastor's family. As one of six kids, I grew up in Orange County living the life of the movie The Sandlot. And if you've never seen that movie, it's about kids growing up in Southern California. I recommend it. And then I met the girl of my dreams, and I got married, and I had three smart, good-looking kids. That's the ordinary part. The extraordinary part is that I have had a personal relationship with Jesus my whole life. And when I was five, my mother took us to a Billy Graham crusade, and when the altar call came, I said to my mother, we should go down. Right? And she answered, but we already believe. And I said, well, then we need to go down there and show them that we do, right? <laughs> so down we went, onto the field. And I believe that even at that moment, as an action of a child, God acknowledged that faith response, and at that moment I was born again. Now, I've not always been the best friend to Jesus, and in fact, sometimes I've been pretty bad, but Jesus has always been there for me. And throughout my life, I, like everyone else here, in addition to the good, I've had disappointment, and pain, hardship, and failure, and all the things that this world gives us, but it has been the fact that God was with me that I've been able to make it through all of that. And where am I? In fact, I've been the strongest when I've given whatever my challenge to God and the weakest when I tried to solve it myself. So Jesus is showing us by an example here in his last words and actions, we are to commit our lives to Jesus and let him be in control of what happens and give our life cheerfully. It is the ultimate trust fall. You know, when you fall back and people catch you. Yeah. So he's already caught you. You know, just go ahead and let go. Thank you.